Good morning, and welcome to River Oaks. If we've not met before, my name's Drew. Uh, I'm on the pastoral team here, and I don't watch a lot of, a lot of TV outside of sports, um, but praise God, football season is right around the corner. Can I get an amen? Amen. Uh, one of my guilty pleasures, though, is watching uh, survivalist TV shows on Netflix, uh, things like Alone, if you've never seen Alone before, I, l- I love Alone. Uh, probably I love it because it's like fantasy to me. Uh, the fact that if you're not familiar with the premise that, that somebody uh, can get dropped off in the, the Arctic Circle all alone with only 10 items in sub-freezing temperatures and then stay alive all by themselves for months on end, that's incredible to me. I mean, I, I was in Cub Scouts for three months before I quit. Um, just gives you a bit of an idea. I mean, I just, I cannot fathom. I always think like, I can make it a week. And Bree's like, no, you can't. Like you'd be out like 48 hours max. Um, there's a show that I, uh, I was, I've been watching. It's not nearly as intense as Alone. It's more of like a team-based reality competition with the whole idea that the last team standing out in the wilderness wins. And so there's a little bit of a twist at the end, though, um, that they, they gave them a, a finish line, like several miles from their camps. They said, first team there wins. And everybody's like super calorie deficient, really weak. And so uh, they, they create their plans, and there's two teams left. One team goes a little further around, but it's through open territory, terrain. They got to cross water, though. The other team, they're like, you know what? We're just, we're, we're making a direct line as close as we can, and we're just going to go for it. So they got to go through this really dense forest. And so their plan was they had a, they had a compass. And so they kind of set their bearing, their directions. And so they kind of had this bearing as they're going through the forest. They didn't know what was up ahead. They didn't know, but they had a direction, right? They had their bearing. Unfortunately for them, they got off their bearing. They got a little lost, went kind of the wrong direction. And then spoiler alert, they end up losing a million dollars to the other team uh, that won. They got, they got beat. Here's why I'm telling you that story, uh, because I don't want anybody to be a loser, um, is we're talking about in, in this month of August, we're talking about our four core values that we have as a church here at, at River Oaks. And, and I think it's important that we talk about our core values because they're kind of like a compass for us as a church. They're, they kind of allow us to set a, a bearing, a direction for us to go as a church, that, that even where we don't really know what's up ahead, we know the things that we want to be true of us. That even, even in the midst of, of a chaotic season or, or a season where we, we don't really know what's going on, you know, it gives us clarity and focus about the direction we still want to go as a church, who we want to be, because over time, these, these core values become defining characteristics for us. As, as a church, because they remind us of, of our, our mission of making fully devoted followers of Jesus who go to our neighbors with the message of Jesus, grow with our neighbors in a pursuit of Jesus, and then show compassion to our neighbors with the love of Jesus. And so these core values become defining characteristics of us as a church. And, and so here's what that means. It means if you hang around River Oaks long enough, these things are, should be obvious to you that they are very important to us. It should be obvious to you that that is the direction we're going and that is who we are trying to be as a church. Now, here's why it's important that we spend a month talking about them. Because before we are a nonprofit 501c3 organization, we are a church. And and church in the Greek, the the word is, is ekklesia, just it means gathering. So the church in its purest form is not an organization, it's an organism. It's a people that's made up of many different parts, like a body. We all come together to be the church. And so so if these core values are going to be defining characteristics for us as a church, they have to be our core values, yeah, they got to be the core values of, of our elders and our deacons and our staff, but more, more important than all of that, for these core values to be defining characteristics of us as a church, they have to be your, your core values and they have to be my core values. They have to be our core values because the church is not an organization, it's an organism first. And so it's important that we talk about 
what we want to be true of us as a place and a people. So this month, we're going to be talking about our core values of evangelism, connectedness, generosity, and excellence. Today, we're talking about the first one, which is evangelism, which is kind of a funny word if you think about it. I've been looking at this word a lot this week as I've been preparing for this. You know how when you look at a word for too long, your brain starts to be like, that looks really weird. I'm there with evangelism. It's like evangelism. evangelism. It's a weird word. It's a word we don't really use in a lot of other places necessarily, but it has been a little hijacked in this cultural moment, at least other variations of it, like the word evangelical. Maybe you've heard that in the news cycle, because evangelicals have been kind of boiled down into a voting block that's used as a pawn in a political game, right? We're, we're, we're evangelicals, so we all vote one way, right? And so it's kind of a loaded term in this cultural moment. And yet, that's not really what evangelism really means. In in the Greek, the the word, uh, the Greek word that that is the root of evangelism is this word euangelion, which is another another really weird word that it's fun to say, so you should do that at home on your own. Uh, Just euangelion, just literally translated means this, good news. Evangelism, euangelion, means good news. So if, if, if you, uh, the first time we really kind of see this in, in the New Testament is in Luke chapter 2, verse 10, and, and the angels, these angels show up, they pop up out of the sky, they're over these shepherds, and they are announcing the birth of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 2, Verse 10, it says this, but the angel reassured them, the shepherds, they said, don't be afraid, I bring you, here it is, good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. This word euangelion didn't get used a whole lot in ancient times. The, the Really the only place that it was used in a secular setting was to announce the birth of a king. It was to announce the the birth of an heir to the throne. This was euangelion. It was good news to declare that a king, that the heir to the throne had been born. If you you really want to get to what is euangelion at its core, think about the opening scene of of Lion King. You know what I'm talking about? Like, that scene, you know, and all the animals, they're like coming and they're gathering around Pride Rock. And here's Rafiki and he holds up little baby Simba and everybody's going crazy. That's euangelion. That is, that is good news. That is the declaration that a king has been born. We, we see, uh, as you continue through the New Testament, we see in Luke chapter 7, 22, we see this idea of good news. Go back, this is Jesus talking, to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. The blind see and the lame walk and those with leprosy are cured and the deaf hear and the dead are raised to life and the good news is being preached to the poor. Over in Matthew chapter 4 verse 23, Jesus, he traveled through the region of Galilee teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom and he healed every kind of disease and illness. And so evangelism is to announce the good news about the kingdom of God and King Jesus. This is evangelism. When you hear this term in its simplest form is to announce the good news about the kingdom of God and King Jesus. And at River Oaks, we we hope to be a place and a people who unashamedly give our time, our talents, and our treasure to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to our neighbors who desperately need it. Like like as as a church, if you hang around here long enough, we want it to be obvious that we are not trying to be a little holy huddle that's just kind of in here and we're all kind of like just holding on for dear life, you know, waiting out the darkness and the brokenness in the world, praying that Jesus just comes back and scoops us up out of here before it gets too bad. Like that's not who we're trying to be as a church. We we are trying to be a church that instead goes on the offensive against the powers of darkness and the, the evil principalities of this age to take the fight all the way to the gates of hell. For the sake of our neighbors, we're trying to reach more people with the good news of the kingdom of God and of our King Jesus. That's who we're trying to be. And for some of you, you're like, yeah, let's go. You know, you're William Wallace, blue face paint. You are locked, loaded, ready to go to battle for that. And some of you are like, well, 
talking to people kind of makes me nervous. And, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason that you feel differently about that. Because some of us, we actually have the spiritual gift of evangelism, and some of us don't. So some of us, when the moment we gave our life to Christ, and you were filled, sealed, and, and saved by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gave you a special spiritual gift of evangelism, which just means you're really good and natural at just boldly telling people about your faith, telling them about Jesus, telling them about the good news of the kingdom of God and of our King Jesus. You're just good at it, man. You walk into a gas station. I know people, they walk into a gas station, and by the time they walk out, they've led three people to Christ while they're filling up their big gulp. It's incredible. It's insane. Like, I don't have that gift, but some people do. And yet, here, here's what is true. That, as, that all fully devoted followers of Jesus, we are all commanded and called to tell others about the good news. We all are. Whether you got the gift or whether you don't got the gift. We are all commanded and called to tell others about the good news. Now, think about it this way, okay? How many of you would say you are an avid fisherman or women? You are an avid fisher person. Like you, you're a good fisher. And you know what you're doing? Kyle, put your hand up, man. Somebody's got to. Okay, put your hand up. Okay, come on. I knew I had one in this service. I had zero first service. It was awesome. Um, <laughs> but you know where to go. You know what kind of bait to use. You know who's biting where. You're just, you got it, right? Some of us, we are avid fishermen or women persons. Let me ask it this way. How many of you have gone fishing at least once in your lifetime? All right, there we go, right? When we went to Hawaii uh, to see Bree's family, Brody and I, we got to go out with my brother-in-law, Eric, to go fishing. And Eric is a fisherman. I mean, uh, we were going for a while. He's got his own boat, his own gear, the setup. I mean, he's... He, he's got it going on, right? He knew what time we had to get up. He knew how long it was going to get to go to where we need to go on the island. He knew how deep the water had to be. He was talking about fathoms and things I didn't understand. He knew how far off the coast to be. He knew what kind of lures to use. He knew how fast the boat needed to go. And then once we hooked something, how slow the boat needed to go to keep the right tension, but to not lose. Like he knew what he was doing. He was calling the shots and I just did what I was told right? That was my participation in this event. I did what I was told. And so there was one moment where, where Eric, he puts us in the money spot. We had four lures in the water, and we, we hooked two, two Ono, two Wahoo at the same time. And so Eric looked at me, goes, hey, Drew, go reel that one in. I'm like, I got this. Sweet. And so I go up, and it's this big old honking reel, right? And I look at it, and I go to reel it, and it doesn't budge. Like, it doesn't go anywhere. And I was like, okay, cool. Some of the reels on the boat were automatic reels. You just push a button. It's like, zzzz. it was awesome. This was not one of those. But I was confused because it didn't move. I was like, so I, I thought it was locked. Maybe it was an auto reel. I'm looking for the on button, whatever the case is. I look at Eric. I'm like, Eric, what's going on? He goes, move over. And he just starts going, rrr, rrr, rrr. he goes, you just got to put your back into it. And I was like, okay, uh, that thing kicked my butt. I think I actually got a video of it kicking uh, my butt. I mean, that's an automatic reel that just, zzz, it's awesome. And so, I mean, he's over there like video to, he's like heckling me. He's literally heckling me going, come on, Drew, reel it in. I was like, dude, this has got to be the biggest one that we catch all day. It was, it was the smallest. It was the small, it was the smallest fish that we caught all day. So trust me when I tell you that I understand that there's a difference between being a fisherman and just knowing, like going fishing. There's a difference. I get it. But as fully devoted followers of Jesus, we are all commanded and called to go fishing for people, whether, whether we're fishermen or not. It's a call that God has placed on our lives. Matthew 4.19, Jesus is calling his disciples, and, and this is what it says. Jesus called out to them. He says, come, follow me, and I'm going to show you how to fish for people. I'm going to give you a purpose as one of my followers to go fishing for people. As fully devoted followers of Jesus who go, grow, and show, we are all called and commanded to go fishing for people whether we are good at it or not. Now, I'm not saying you've got to go preach in 7-Eleven. That's not what I'm saying. But we're all called 
to go fishing for people because evangelism oftentimes, man, it just starts with an invitation. Evangelism, announcing the good news of the kingdom of God and King Jesus, it just, it starts with an invitation because here's what is so powerful about an invitation. It just tells somebody, hey, I see you and you are welcome and I value you. Like, I want, I want to be with you. It, it's such a powerful thing. And, and the great thing about making an invitation, you don't even have to know what you're doing. Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is calling his disciples. And one of the guys that he calls to be his disciple is a despicable human being. I mean, he's not a nice guy. His name's Matthew. He's a tax collector. He's a sellout. He's working for the oppressive Roman government, and he's getting really rich. And the way he's getting rich is by extorting his neighbors in order to make money off of them. And, and yet Jesus calls Matthew to, and I can guarantee you, Matthew is not a guy that knows how to go fishing for people. But this, this is what it says, Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. It says this, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in his ta- tax collector's booth. He says, follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. And later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as, as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Matthew's a guy, he has no idea uh, how to go fishing for people, but he knows how to throw a party. And so what does he do? There's a party. He just makes an invitation. And when the religious leaders see this, they're like, whoa, why is Jesus eating with these scum, these disreputable? By the way, Matthew's writing this about himself. So it's okay that we call Matthew these mean things, okay? He said about himself, right? Why is Jesus eating? Why is your rabbi eating with this scum? And if you know the story, Jesus says, hey, listen, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And I have come to seek and save. I've come to go fishing for those who are sick. The fishing for those who are lost. Fishing for those who know they need to be saved. That's my purpose here. It's evangelism. And yet, I think think when we think about evangelism, sometimes you think, okay, so evangelism is, it's it's calling out people's sin. It's just telling people how wrong they are. We're going to win people with the truth. We think of somebody standing on a street corner with a megaphone telling everybody they're going to go to hell. Like, that's evangelism. I don't think that, that, I don't think that's a very good evangelism. Instead, evangelism is to declare the good news. It, I think we'd be way more effective if we thought about evangelism as not telling people how lost they are. It's actually by showing people how loved they are. I think we would be more effective at this if instead of of telling people or at least acting in a way that says, hey, you got to get yourself cleaned up, you got to change. And once you change, then you can be invited to be a part of us. And instead we say, hey, we want you to come be a part. And when you're a part of us, Jesus is going to change you. It's going to be awesome. I think think one way is way more effective than the other. Now, here's, here's a kicker, okay? I think here's a kicker. In order for this to work, we have got to be the kind of place and the kind of people that our neighbors who don't follow Jesus actually want to be a part of. Okay? For this to work. You know what FOMO is? You're familiar with that acronym? Fear of missing out. FOMO, it's if you're scrolling social media and you see... Uh, a picture of some mutual friends or something and they're all hanging out having a good time and you didn't get invited and you're kind of like, well, why didn't I get invited to that? I feel kind of left out. That feeling is called FOMO. And my question for us is what if we were the kind of people, what if we were the kind of place that people who don't even believe what we believe from the outside looking in go, wouldn't it be cool if they invited us? Wouldn't it be really cool if they just let us be a part of, of that? I don't even know what they believe. But I'd love to be a part of it. They, they look at your community group that you're in and they see how well you care for each other and the impact that you're making in the community. And they go, man, they seem like they really love each other, like they have purpose. Wouldn't it be great if, if they would invite me to be a part of that? If they look at your family 
and, and, and as they look at your family and how you love one another and, and the values that you have as a family and how kind you are, they look and go, man, wouldn't it be great if they invited us over for dinner? I would love for my kids to be friends with their kids. Those are the kinds of people I want my kids hanging out with. What, what if as people interacted with you in the office or, or in the hallway at school, as you get, go back to school or as you're, you're working on your team or whatever the case is, you're so kind and generous and compassionate towards it. You just make them feel good that they're like, I would love to spend more time with that person. They just, they just make me feel good. What if, what if we were a people? What if we were a place that our neighbors who believe something differently than us, they get FOMO. Not even because of what we believe initially, but because of who we are. Let me ask you a question. What's it like to be on the other side of you? Honest question. What's it like to be on the other side of you? Put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's not a Christian. And they're like creeping on your social media account, trying to see it, you know what I mean? Trying to get a picture of who you are. Now, based on that, do you think, if you walked up to them and said, hey, we would love to have you guys over for dinner Friday night. We, we would love if you joined us at River Oaks next Sunday morning. Do you think, based on what it's like to be on the other side of you, they would go, Yes, absolutely. And they would eagerly accept your invitation? Or do you think they go, no, man, I ain't doing that. I think it's a good question to ask her. What's it like to be on the other side of you? Because if we can be a place and a people that people who are far from Christ, our neighbors who don't know Jesus, if they would eagerly accept that invitation, then doggone it, we're doing evangelism. At least the first part of it. Because the cool thing is, this, is if we can be the, a place and a people that others want to be a part of, once they accept an invitation, the greatest evidence for the good news about Jesus is your life. The greatest evidence we have for the good news of Jesus, it's, it's your life. And when, I, when you hear me say that, I am not saying the evidence is that we're all perfect little Christians. And that, you know, we're going to be perfect and, and you know, we're never going to sin, we're never going to... In fact, I think if that is the expectation, that's actually a harmful expectation. Because we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the standard God set for us. Like, we're just, we're sinners. And so if that's the expectation, we're just setting ourselves up to be hypocrites. And nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, today I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be a hypocrite. That's not what we want. But that's, the, that's what we're setting ourselves up for when the expectation is perfection. And instead, when I say the greatest evidence for the good news of Jesus is your life, is the fact that you're not perfect and that you're saved anyway. It's the fact that, that, that you, you are a perfect example of the love and grace of God on your life. And what's available to people who are desperately looking for it. See, what, when we invite people to, into our imperfect lives and we invite people into our imperfect church, they get a front row seat to see the perfect love of God and, and, and his grace on display. That's why I love Ephesians 2, man. Paul, the Apostle Paul, he's laying down the gospel. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's none of your doing. You can't boast about this. He's saying the only reason that you have been saved is because God loves you and he thought it was a good idea to save you. You haven't done anything to deserve this. And in, in the midst of just kind of this, this teaching, Ephesians 2, 7, he says this, he says, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for those who are united with Christ Jesus. Paul is saying that our lives are examples of the fact that we are saved by grace. 
It's a perfect demonstration. And in fact, the picture that he kind of wants us to have is like, we're like these little trophies that God gets to point to and be like, see that one? That one's real broken, real sinful, but that one's mine. I saved that one. I love that one. Because this is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. It's not anything that we have done. And so the powerful thing about invitation is you get to demonstrate to people what they need. That you need a God to save you. You need grace in your life. You need mercy and love in your life. You're not going to be able to do this on our own. And yet I think the imperfections in our life keep us from, from doing the work of evangelism. Because we think, I know I'm imperfect, so that disqualifies me from going fishing for people. And yet the exact thing you think disqualifies you from sharing your faith is the very thing that qualifies you to tell your story. The exact thing, I could never do that because, you know, I just, I'm not good enough or whatever. That's exactly what you, you cuss a little bit. You know what? Somebody needs to see that God's grace is sufficient in your life. You're not a perfect parent. Somebody needs to see that in our weakness, God's grace is more. You're going through a rough spot in your marriage. I bet they have or they will. But God's grace is enough. You got something nasty in your past? I bet they do too. And so, listen, I'm not trying to minimize sin. I'm not, I'm not trying to, to lower the standard of, of personal holiness that God is calling us to. But what I am saying is that our lives are evidence that we have been saved by grace. We have not earned our salvation. And and I'm becoming more and more convinced that in, in in the cultural moment in which we are living, the first step to doing good evangelism is not to convince anybody what is true. It's just to show them that even in the brokenness of their life and even in the mess that they have made and their sin, God's grace is sufficient and his love abounds. Step one. And so when we think about evangelism, a lot of times, I mean, I I don't know. For me, at least for a long time, I thought about evangelism like a courtroom scene. And in the midst of this scene, I pictured myself as the defense attorney. That I had, to, I had to be able, I had to be prepared in order to give a rebuttal, to give an answer to every question that everybody asked in order to do evangelism well. You know, well, what about creation? Did God create everything in six days or six million years? Well, well, well what about why? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why are babies born with birth defects? I thought, well, if I don't have good answers to those questions, I'm not good at this. I'm going to avoid doing it. And yet, here's what I'll tell you. I will give you permission today, okay? That when you get asked questions like that and you don't have good answers, to just be humble enough to look them in the eyes and go, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know about creation. I I don't know about theodicy. I don't have a good working theory for how a a sovereign and benevolent God can exist alongside the pain and suffering we see in our world. I I don't know. But, But here's what I know. I was dead in my transgressions and sin. But God, who is rich in love and mercy, he made me alive in Christ because he loved me. I can tell you what my life was like before Christ. I can tell you what my life was like after Christ. I I can tell you that I don't deserve to be loved by the God of the universe, but I know that I am. And so when you think about evangelism, don't, don't be an attorney that defends God. Be a witness that gives testimony to his loving grace. You don't gotta defend God. God, he'll be fine. Just be a witness to the love and grace of God that you have experienced in your life. And then let God do what he does. 
And so here's my hope. Here's my, here's my prayer for us as, as a church. That we, when we think about our core value of evangelism, it's not something that scares us. It's not something like, yeah, well, some people do that. Yeah, it's not an intimidating thing for us. Instead, when we think about evangelism, it's something that, that brings joy to our heart and it puts, a, it puts a smile on our face. Because here's the deal. There is joy found in catching fish. Have you ever seen a picture after somebody catches a fish and they're mad about it? <laughs> they're holding up their fish and closer to the camera so it looks bigger than what it really is, you know? And they just look mad about it. Brody was pumped! There's joy found in catching fish. And if you were not at worship and baptism Thursday night, when we celebrated and heard testimonies, and as 20 different people gave witness to the good news of the kingdom of God and our king, like, I promise you, every single person who came up out of that water was not, I mean, they were all beaming. None of them were upset about it. Because there is something powerful and purposeful as fully devoted followers of Jesus when we align our lives with what God has called us to. There is something joyful found that, that we find. But when we do what God has called us to do, commanded us to do, what he has made us to do, And it starts with an invitation. It starts with an invitation. So here's my question for you. Who can you make an invitation to this week? And here's my prayer. Right now, the Holy Spirit puts someone on your mind right now. Who can you make an invitation to this week? Invite him to coffee. Invite him over to dinner. Invite him to check out your community group. Invite him to join you at River Oaks next week. But who is the Holy Spirit placing on your heart and in your mind to go, you know, I, I can make an invitation there. I can go fishing this week. Whether I'm good at it or not, doggone it, I'm going to try. Because we want to be a place and we want to be a people that are unashamedly spending our time, our talent, and our treasure going to our neighbors with the message of Jesus Christ so they can witness the good news of the kingdom of God and our King Jesus in their lives firsthand. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that while we were still sinners, Christ, Jesus, you died for us. When we, man, we don't deserve it. I know I don't deserve it. And yet because of your grace and your mercy and your love towards us, you made a way where there was no way. And God, I, I think of the people in my life, my parents, my grandparents, a basketball coach in middle school who went fishing for me, who had, who had an impact. It was just an invitation who did their part to, to lead me to you by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, I thank you for them, and, and I pray that in this moment, maybe you just bring to mind for each of us in this room who, who those people have been for them, and, and, and then give us a passion to be that for somebody else. Give us a desire, give us a, a burden deep within our bones to go to our neighbors with the message of Jesus Christ, because, because our world desperately needs it. The people that we love, you just, we just see them looking for purpose. We, we just see them struggling without a direction for their lives, chasing the wrong things, things that ultimately we know don't have an eternal impact on their lives. Thinking back to the Revelation series, God, we, we want to be used by you. And so Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would do a work in our hearts. You would just set, set in our spirit a fire to be a people, to be a place 
just tells other people about you. We don't got to be weird about it, but just tells other people to make an invitation to know this Jesus that saved us, this Jesus that pulled us out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. So Holy Spirit, I just pray you place on our heart and mind just a name. Just give us a name this week that we can just make an invitation to. That maybe that invitation just begins to plant seeds for the benefit of our neighbor, for the glory of your name, and for the advancement of your kingdom. Pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.